We've been studying the two great commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. And the second is like the first, not like because they're both great and not like the first because they're both about love. The second commandment to love your neighbor as yourself is like the first because you can't have one without the other. You're not really living till you're loving God and God accepts no love from human hearts that are gripped by hate. Just think of that. God accepts no love from human hearts that are gripped by hate. That's why the scripture says, leave your gift at the altar and go and be reconciled. Because, because why? Because God's like, nah, 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 nah. Why are you here? Why are you here? Why are you here? You hate, you hate, you hate. Go love and forgive. Then come back and bring your gift. So all of this teaching first was on the priority of love for many, many weeks. And now for several weeks, the problems of love, we've addressed the external problems, uh, mainly the external problem to love continuing is offense. And we've been looking at what God gives to get over offense. Uh, mercy, um, mercy halts offense by withholding. I've been teaching you that mercy is when I'm offended, I just, I don't do anything. I just don't do anything by withholding my words, by withholding my actions, by saying nothing. Some of my greatest victories in my life. What'd you do? Tell me what I did. Nothing. nothing. I didn't say anything. I didn't do anything. And so that's mercy. Just, you, know, you well, but you should have said, and, and no one would have blamed you for saying, I agree, that's why I agree. That's why it's called mercy. And then this, mercy halts offense by withholding. Uh, grace limits offense by covering. And, 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 and offense, the offense that I feel because she said, because he did, because they blank, that offense that we feel is being limited when we bless those that curse us, pray for those that spitefully use us. When we begin to actually do things, you say, well, they don't deserve those things, correct. That's my point. That's why it's called grace unmerited favor. God gives it to us and we give it to others. So who offended you this week in the store, in the traffic, in the hallway, at your school, in the business, by your desk, at your house, on your computer? Who offended you? Mercy, that's a big play. Doing nothing. Grace, bigger still. Bless them. Pray for them give grace and then now finally the final thing that God gives us mercy halts offense by withholding grace limits offense by covering here it comes forgiveness ends offense by releasing it's over it's over gosh you seem to be over it I am wow she really seems to be over it she is forgiveness ends offense by releasing She's like, man, I don't want to forgive. That's why this message is called Five Reasons to Forgive. Open your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to be in Matthew 6 and then right on to Matthew 18 for the totality of this message. Uh, five reasons why we should, why we must forgive. I'll start with this because, as I just stated, forgiveness ends offense. When I forgive, when I forgive, I end the offense. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14, let me read it to you. Matthew 6, 14 says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you your trespasses. But, it's like stating now in the reverse, if you do not forgive others their trespasses, it does stand to reason, right? If you forgive others their trespasses, your Father in heaven will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now, you can't mumble through the scriptures like that unless you're in a church filled with people who are looking at their Bible, which I am sure that you are. And I sometimes I do that so that it makes you think that you're reading it too, because I'm reading and you're reading it, right? For if you forgive your trespasses, their trespasses, their heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't, if you don't oh yeah. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, it's right there. It's right there. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. 
Forgiveness is the end of the offense. Now, um, somebody say, just, just, just somebody, it probably should be you. Somebody say, what's the context? Thank you for knowing that you should be the one to say that. The context is very important when you're studying the Bible. You don't just rip open the Bible and start reading. You don't even know where you are, right? So the context is the Lord's Prayer. Come on, let's say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, I learned, as we, wait, wait, as we, as we, as we, who trespass against us and lead us not into, but deliver us from, some versions say, for yours is the kingdom, the, and the, for, and ever. Okay, okay, Lord's Prayer. Now, that's the context. Now, what do you suppose, what do you suppose, Jesus Christ was thinking about after he taught them his prayer. You can say his prayer, right? Whose, whose prayer is it? It's the Lord's prayer. It's his prayer. He's the Lord. It's his prayer. He's like, pray like this. What do you think he was thinking right after he said it? I think he might have been thinking, man, I hope they don't make this into a religion. You know where you say it over and over and over. I, I couldn't get as many people to say John 3, 16 as I just got all of you to say word perfect, the Lord's Prayer. You're like, well, how could I not say it perfect? I used to have this guy used to tell me, go say it a hundred times. <laughs> I mean, by the time you said it a hundred times, you got it, right? And then somewhere you figured out, I don't know if this is supposed to be a, because it isn't supposed to be a over and over and over and over and over and over and over. If that blesses you and helps you connect with the Lord, I would not discourage you from that in any way. Praying is great. But Jesus gave his prayer as a model prayer, as a pattern for prayer. Um, I've taught on that at other times. We're working on the context. I don't think, though, that he was thinking, I hope they don't make this into a necklace. I think... He might have been thinking, man, I hope these guys are getting this because they're completely up the creek without a paddle if they don't learn how to pray. I just showed them how to pray. I gave them the elements of prayer. I hope they, do you think he was thinking that? Well, the great thing about studying the context is you don't have to wonder what he was thinking about because after he gave the Lord's Prayer, he was thinking about the phrase in the middle of it, forgiveness. Being the awesome pastor, which means shepherd, that he is, Jesus Christ felt as he led the disciples in his prayer, he felt that that part about forgiveness was going to be a bit sticky. Because he had them all pray, forgive us our trespasses as, say it, as we forgive those who, as we forgive those who, which by the way, by the way, um, all in favor of God forgiving you the way that you forgive others. Who thinks that's an awesome idea? I want God to forgive me the exact same way that I forgive. When I'm ready. When I want to. When they get it. All in favor of not being forgiven as we forgive? Problem is, we don't get to vote. The Bible says again and again and again and again and again that we will be, the measure we use will be used on us. The way that we forgive is how God is going to ultimately forgive us. So actually, I would probably reverse those two things and say that um, forgiven people forgive. In Christ, Forgiven people become more forgiving. Ephesians 4, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, here it is, 
Forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. When you comprehend the extent of what you have been forgiven, you become increasingly forgiving yourself. Unforgiveness is indicative of a failure to understand how much I have been forgiven. So, what was on Jesus' mind was, they're going to get stuck here. Everyone gets stuck here. To err is human, do you know this? And to forgive is divine. Everyone has always recognized that this is the least human thing to do. Old Testament, they had it. Eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. That's human. Forgiving, forgiving. Make a note of this definition. Forgiveness is the decision to release a person from the obligation that resulted when they injured you. I should preach this sermon every year. We should just like start Forgiveness Sunday. There probably aren't many things that I've thought about through the years that need such frequent repeating. The word forgive is 143 times in the New Testament. It's a legal term that means to release from obligation. It, it's the idea of to pardon or to cancel a debt. So even though the teaching is things we've talked about before, the illustrations have to be fresh because that's the way I am. I found this box of chocolates. Nothing like a little sugar before church. Trust me on that. And so I, I said, Kathy, what's this box for? She said, oh, she said, don't touch that. <laughs> she said, that is for the pastor's wives. And I'm going to take these beautiful chocolates and I'm going to set them out on a plate and the ladies are going to like them so much. So I opened it, you know, hoping for the sneak. What's better than pulling one from the under layer? I'm going to say in the world of forgivables, that hardly ever gets caught. Because the first one's gone. Most people don't look underneath. And then they flip the other one, like, well, I guess, I guess someone got one. You hardly ever get caught with that, just for what it's worth. And, and uh, so here, it's open now. Wow, these do not look bad. Oh, one layer, so weak. It's kind of hard to go wrong with the chocolate and nut one. Oh, you know, that's not as good as I thought. I... Okay, that's just a bad idea. The white on the outside and that fudgy thing on the inside, that was decided by a committee for sure. No, they won't know that I touched them, right? <laughs> Don't tell my wife this. At what point, you always want to unwrap the ones that you, because I don't know what's in here. <laughs> At what point has this gone too far? At what point has this gone too far? I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Okay, raise your hand if you think that's adequate, ladies. <laughs> One lady raised her hand. She probably did something really bad today. Oh, of course. <laughs> you should for sure forgive. <laughs> Here. So. Oh, she says she wants the ribbon too. No, I kind of want that. I, I think that I should have another bite. No, I think, I think it gets to the place where it's going to take more than a couple of words to get this resolved. Somebody's going to have to come up with another box of chocolates and say, Honey, you know how much you love the church, and it was for the church, and... She said I could do this. And I wouldn't do it without asking. 
we get offended. Doing nothing is really hard. Showing mercy, not giving them what they deserve, that's tough. Grace, praying for the person that's offending us, blessing the person that seems entirely indifferent to our need. But releasing them, you all had the feeling when I was doing that, and he's gonna owe her. He's gonna owe her. Forgiveness is the decision to release a person from the obligation that results from them injuring me. I'm releasing you. You don't owe me. You don't owe me anymore. There's nothing outstanding. I'm writing it off. It is done. It is finished. It is resolved. It is behind us. Nothing else needs to be said. I'm letting go. That's forgiveness. Far easier to define than to offer truly. I had, I'm going to try not to cry about it. I had one of the greatest meetings I have ever had in my whole life this week. So often I have been disappointed by Christians who say all of these things, but when the offense is there, they will not meet. They will not resolve. They will not forgive. What are the reasons that people give for not doing this? Uh, this illustration I have used before, and because I don't have a better one, I'm gonna use it again. And I use this thing here, this thing here, this, this thing here, this thing, to represent an offense that you've been carrying maybe for a long time. If I came into church today and I was like, Hey, everybody. How many people think that they would be able to say, something's not right here? <laughs> Hands up if you think you could spot it. I, I think he should go to the doctor. Maybe soon. But using the analogy of a tumor, in fact, let me just say that unforgiveness is like a tumor in your soul. Here are the common rationalizations that we give for doing maintenance on a tumor in our soul. One of the things that we say is, it's too big. It's too big. Now that is wrong. Isn't it the bigger it is, the more you would, you'd be like, get it all, doc. Give me double anesthetic, keep me under for a day, don't wake me up till it's gone. True or false? It's just such a bad plan, but we, we sometimes we're like, the little things, fine, but not that. Or, I just hear this so commonly, it bears repeating, time will heal it. How's that going? Time might get me to think about it less often, possibly. But when I see the person, when I'm reminded of the situation, it comes back fast and with a vengeance. It's not healed. It's not healed. So write down the name that came to mind when I said that. Common rationalizations for not forgiving. I'll forgive it when they say they're sorry. How's that going? Let me just tell you something, I have no joy in saying this. That's probably not coming. I, I mean, only one in 10 comes back to say thank you. So, how many are coming to really say, hey, sorry, that's on me. It takes a level of spiritual maturity and an amount of selflessness and self-awareness I love all of you so much. I just want you to be free, and I, I just don't want you laying awake waiting for a sorry guy. 
probably not coming. Or this, I can't forgive if I can't, what? Okay, that's completely wrong. It's actually the opposite that is true. You'll never forget until you forgive. Write that down if you want. You'll never forget until you forgive. Forgiveness is not the destination, y'all. It's the means of getting there. Forgiveness is not the goal. It's the means to the goal. It's the transportation on the journey. You have to forgive. You have to release them from the obligation that resulted when they injured you. Now, just a little bit of clarity on this point, um, this forgetting thing. God, I don't want to wear this no more. God does not, God does not forget. He does not forget. He does something way better than forgetting. When God says that he'll cast our sins as far as the east is from the west, when he says that he'll bury them in the bottom of the deepest sea, you're like, that's still a place. Correct. God can't forget. God can't forget. He hasn't forgotten your sin. He's doing something way better than forgetting. He treats us as though it never happened. That's the sense in which it's in the deepest sea. That's, he is relating to you in Jesus Christ as though that never occurred. Come on, say grace. And that's what he wants. He's not asking us to forget. You will over time. The memories will become duller if you let go of them through forgiveness. Here's a simple, simple little help. So what is it then? Well, in all forgiveness, and I've seen so many people blessed by this little teaching I'm going to do here for three minutes. This little part right here. If you have this already, pray, because this is one of the keys that unlocks the door to freedom for people. Okay? Okay. So let's just believe that the Holy Spirit's working right now. In all change, there is a crisis and a process. There is the moment in time where I make the decision and I write down the names and I leave the building, there's the crisis. You're like, man, if I do that, I'm gonna be right back on this by Thursday. Correct. So this, when I fail, in the process, which I'll give you in a moment. When I fail in the process, I have to come back to the crisis. And if God has convicted me that I can't be bitter toward Millie anymore, then I have now committed myself that if I'm unforgiving toward, what was her name? Millie, if I'm unforgiving toward her now, now point to who's in sin now. I'm in sin now. And so I have to go back to the crisis and I have to ask God to forgive me for my unforgiveness. I'm the one who's in sin. Now, here's the process. It's threefold and it's straightforward. Forgiveness, releasing the person from the obligation that resulted when they injured. Here's how it goes, Kath. You can, if you're going to forgive me, you can't bring the chocolate thing up to me anymore. And you can't bring it up to other people. You can't be like, Abby, did you see your father tonight? Can you believe what a scene he made about those chocolates? I mean, was that, you can't do that. You can't bring it up to me. You can't bring it up to others. <laughs> yes, I know that I'm using something very light to talk about something very heavy. Because the hardest part is, I can't bring it up to them, I can't bring it up to others, and I can't bring it up to my, say it, to myself. I can't, when I find myself standing in the shower for 25 minutes and somebody's like, when are you gonna get out? And you didn't even realize all the time was going by as you were standing there going over the hurt that's been caused you. That's unforgiveness and that's sin. And now I have to go back to the crisis again. I don't jump out of the shower and get dried off and go have an awesome quiet time. I get out of the shower and get dressed and go sit somewhere and tell God that I'm so sorry for refusing the grace that he has offered to help me forgive. So crisis and process 
When I fail in the process, there it is, I return to the crisis. Do that for a week and you'll be able to smell freedom. Do that for a month and you'll be able to see it. Do it for a quarter, for three or four months, and you'll be living on the edge of the promised land of freedom. It will go from you. I tell you, in the name of Jesus Christ, based on the authority of God's word, it will go from you. All right? It will be put to, you resist the enemy, and he will flee from you. And you will find such joy, and you will find such delight in the Lord when this thing is removed. So, I can't forgive if I can't forget. And then lastly, back to the common rationalizations. But if I forgive, I mean, if I forgive, they'll just do it again. Oh, you mean you might have to carry two of these? I mean, again, I got to just say, I think that's a reason to get the first one gone. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your Father in heaven will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now turn with me in the same gospel of Matthew over four or five pages to Matthew 18. Matthew 18. Let me tell you a little bit of secret about preaching. Did you know that I know that when I'm preaching, Sometimes your mind wanders. <laughs> Did you know I know that? And, and, and I like to think that at least some of the time it's because I said something and then that got you thinking about something and then you went to something else and something else and all of a sudden I'm up here. <laughs> Said, so, Come back. But I don't feel as bad about that because I see the very same thing happening in the Gospels, right here, for example, in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus is teaching and he says in Matthew 18, 15, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen to you, you know, and along with you, and everyone charged with me, established by the evidence of truth, and if he refuses to tell of the church, and, and a Gentile is a tax and truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth, should be bound in heaven. And for Peter, it was like, <laughs> he didn't hear any of that paragraph. None of it. How do we know? Because in verse 21, Peter comes up to him and says, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? She's like, we're quite a ways past that. That was quite a while ago. I know, I've just been thinking, I don't hear nothing you say. I was just thinking about how many times do I have to do this? Now, Peter thought that he was going big time here. Well, how about seven times the Old Testament law required three times? Three strikes and you're? So three times, you're out, next. And so he thought, well, I'll double it, add one. Seems to be a lot of sevens in the Bible. Let's go with seven. Jesus is about to say, you're awesome, Peter, and I'm kind of looking forward to hear it. So Lord, I mean, we're both pretty mature. <laughs> Let's get a forgiveness number on the board that we can kind of model for other people. How about seven? Thinking that Jesus is going to go. <laughs> seven? You're awesome. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say, that's not what he did, though. That's not what he did. That's not what he did. What he did was. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times. Seven, 77 times. This is a point of interpretation that is somewhat debated. I think it sort of misses the point. Some translators say um, 70 times seven. What is 70 times seven? I was going to get that, but I got what? 490. And then other people say, well, no, no, that should be translated 77 times. Not seven times, 77 times. Or if you put the times in the middle, not 
seven times, 70 times seven. Let's go out for coffee after church and argue about that. <laughs> so that we can completely miss the point, which is stop counting. Stop counting. Stop thinking you get to a place where you don't have to do this. Stop thinking that there's a number where you can say, forget you. We don't sell other people's stock. God doesn't give up on people. We don't either. Love to live to love. So, if love is going to continue, mercy, that'll get some things done. Grace, that'll certainly pave the way. But in the end, forgiveness is the Christian life survival skill. You have to have this. You just have to have it. And people who don't have it, I've changed so much. One of the notes that I'm using in this message from a previous time that I taught this had an illustration of a well-known political figure who stood up and said, and I said their name back then, I wouldn't do that, I just wouldn't do that now. But a person who stood up and said at a political convention, you've heard that we have to forgive 70 times seven, well, I'm counting. <coughs> Interesting how that person became more and more and more and more obviously consumed with bitterness. And this is because of the choice to keep track. This is because of the choice to count. Think of the most unhappy people you know over 60 years of age. It's because of this. The pile got too big. The trailer got too small. The train got too heavy. As we stockpiled a fence through the years and found ourselves angry and alone. Only forgiveness breaks this bondage. There is no other way out of that prison. And there is no prison worse than the bars that we fashion for ourselves. Unforgiveness, self-incarceration. Now, if you're a person who likes to set limits, let me say that the Bible calls for total, unilateral, immediate, and I'm adding a, another one here. The Bible calls for total, that means every offense, unilateral, every person, immediate, do it today, forgiveness. And I've said that probably 10 times in our church. I'm adding the word now, infinite. There is no amount of time that allows me to say I've stood all I can stand, I can't stand no more. If it's abusive, get back and pray and wait. If it's illegal, call the police or call your lawyer, whatever you're gonna do. But if it's just offenses, total, unilateral, immediate, infinite forgiveness. Because we all tend to resist and rebel, let me add this reason. Five reasons to forgive. Because forgiveness ends the offense. Because forgiveness has no limits. If I forgot to say that, please forgive me. It has no limits. Now turn the page in this. I mentioned it already. Because I'm forgiven. Because I'm forgiven. Because I'm forgiven. I forgive because I'm forgiven. Man, I wish Jesus had told a story about that. Come on, what? He did. Peter said, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as 70 times seven, Jesus said to him. I don't say 70. Seven times or 70 times, just don't count. Verse 23, therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to, the kingdom of heaven is the place where things go well from God's perspective. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who... Anyone want to take a guess who's going to, who the king might be in the story? Anyone? 
Let's go with God. God's the king. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. If I had more time, I'd go into a lot of really clever math. Uh, $10 billion. $10 billion. If you have a study Bible, um, Dr. Van Lanningham's here in this service. You can argue with him about that afterwards. $10 billion. Now, $10 billion. Someone say, how much is that? You have no idea how much that is. If you had $10 billion, you could buy the Chicago Bears, the Chicago Cubs, the Chicago Blackhawks. And if there was another team in Chicago, <laughs> oh yeah, the Bulls. That's it, no more. Fine, you could buy the White Sox too. You could buy all those teams and you could build them all a brand new stadium and still have money to buy all your friends tickets and popcorn for the rest of their life, no problem. That's a lot. An unpayable amount. There was a man who was called by a king who owed an unpayable amount. And I am that man. And there was a woman who was called by a king who owed an unpayable amount. And you are that man or that woman. When he began to settle, this one was brought to him. And since he could not pay, totally, they're like, liquidate, ordered him to be sold with his wife and children, all they had in payment to be made. Yeah, we're a little short here on the 10 billion. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything, which is the arrogance of the human heart that thinks that it can pay an unpayable debt. I'll try harder. No, no, no. You cannot save yourself. You have to cast yourself upon the mercy of Christ by faith and receive the gift of forgiveness. Amen. Say amen, loved ones. Amen. And out of pity for him, the master of the servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, which is, you know, a hundred days wages. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. He began to choke him. Pay what you owe. He felt ashamed of the fact that he couldn't pay his debt. So as soon as he found someone else who owed him something, he was like, I need your money. I have to pay what I can't pay. I need what you owe me. Like that would have really made much difference on the 10 billion. And this is the life of the unforgiving person. I'm trying to gain favor with God through my behavior and I am so hard and exacting on everyone else so that if God grades on the curve, he'll see how good I've been. So he said the exact same words, deja vu. But he refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. Yeah, because you make a lot in prison, right? That's such a good plan. How vicious we are in unforgiveness. You're going to a place where you can't pay till you pay. You see how irrational unforgiveness is when his fellow servants saw what had taken place. They were greatly distressed and they went and reported their master all that had taken place. The master... <laughs> summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me and you should, should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in his anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt, which is forever and is a picture of hell, which is the destination of all people whose life characteristic is unforgiveness, regardless of how many times you prayed a prayer or walked an aisle or signed a card. If you are a harsh, bitter, unforgiving person, you are unsaved. And you should write, God. I need to ask God to forgive me.
so also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you who, if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. So, we are forgiven. We should forgive because, why? Because, because forgiveness ends offense. Forgiveness has no limits because I am forgiven. And just this, because unforgiveness destroys other people. I mean, look at that parable. How was his relationship with the guy he choked? What if he like saw him at a barbecue on Saturday? Dude, sorry, I got a little crazy choking you there. Can we have a, <laughs> can we have a burger together? How, come on, how was that gonna go? So unforgiveness shattered the relationship with a fellow servant. What about all the people that were watching it? Notice, when his fellow servants saw, they're like, that's not right, that's not right, that's not right. Come on, this is what Christians do. Let me hear you. Like as if they didn't have unforgiveness in their heart, but they went and told the master and narked and messed up the whole thing. So two relationships with co-workers, humiliation before the king. No words, just silenced. Complete meltdown, throw him in prison. Because unforgiveness destroys other people. I wish I could say a lot more about that. I'll just simply say it again. Unforgiveness destroys other people and maybe more to the point of the decision I'm hoping you're gonna make in just a moment. Are you writing down some names? Because unforgiveness destroys me. In the end, he was destroyed. In the end, he was the one who indicated that Christ had never changed him. Nothing will cut a swath of destruction across your life like unforgiveness.